My name is uh, Patricia Gonzalez, and I am a, um, I'm now a professor at the University of Arizona, but uh, my training is as a traditional um, midwife and uh, herbalist. And I um, come from a family that was Kikapu, Comanche, and Masawal or Nawa from Mexico. And my great-great-grandparents were part of those first migrations of Indian peoples who would go back and forth uh, through Mexico during the Indian Wars. And so in those processes, they mixed in with Mexican Indian people over there, and then they came back into Texas, uh, into what we know today as Texas. At the time they came back, it was still part of Mexico. Um, some of my family are the original peoples of what we know as Texas today. They were never, you know, they never came, as the Kikapu side, we, we were more from the Great Lakes region and kept coming, you know, further south. Uh, but part of my family are the original peoples of the place that we know as Texas today. Um, my um, great-grandfather was a bone setter and an, a, a curandero, an herbalist, and um, he, was, um, he was very well known. When he died, people came from like other towns to his funeral. And he also was, um, you know, did ceremonial medicine, what we know today, what we would call ceremonial medicine. And so when we talk about the traditional use of herbs that uh, now Western medicine, me Western herbalism is trying to uh, understand and arrive at, it, it was usually within a, a, a context of prayer and a, constant, a context of treating things as sacred. So my great grandpa, one of the things that he, that I have inherited from him are his prayers to the four directions with sage. That was part of his medicine was to, was to pray with sage. And there's a particular way that we pray with it. Um, my great uh, grandma on my so that was my great grandpa on my mom's side and my great grandma on my dad's side was a midwife in San Antonio in the 1800s and uh, my grandmother was known for her cupping um, and her herbal she was a really good herbalist and my great grandma was also a good a good herbalist uh, she knew a lot about plants and my grandmother on my my uh, paternal grandmother was um, knew a lot about uh, plant medicine and people used to come to her in the neighborhood for her cupping, what, what uh, Chinese uh, medicine calls cupping, we call ventosas in Spanish. And my grandmother on my mom's side um, was a seer, and my grandpa um, on my mom's side had a lot of m uh, medicine for protection, and so did my, gran my grandma. And so all of those things came together in my family. So it was different kinds of indigenous knowledge and the relationship with prayer and, and, me, and herbal medicine, the medicines, you know, we just call it the medicine, that, um, you know, I, that, that was passed on to me. Um, so I think that what's important to remember about all of this is that as Mexican people become de-indigenized, uh, some of that knowledge stays, but they may not know from what tribe it is, because uh, it's been an ongoing process of de-indigenization. Um, my grandparents identified as Indian people, but we lived around Mexican people, and they also identified as Mexican, and they, they saw Mexican people as uh, Indian people. So I think part of my journey has been to kind of understand and try to tease out certain things and realize sometimes when I'm with uh, my tribal sides, I see similarities to things that were left to me, and then, and then there's things that I know that a lot of Mexican you know, families also carry in their family. There was a lot of general sharing of verbal knowledge, and then there were very specific things that people did in their families, their region, um, or, or by uh, if they had a tribal tradition. And it, it has, so there's a lot of variation in what, was, what, what we have today that we call, uh, in a general sense, Mexican traditional medicine, but it's really indigenous medicine. The way uh, tr traditionally we learn these things, as I've thought about my own life, and you know, I wrote this book, Red Medicine, and I went back and I started thinking about, well, when did I learn? Like people say, well, when did I write this book? And when I started, he's like, well, 20 years, well, no. I mean, it was, began by the side of my grandparents. So even the, the, the context of when you ask about the ceremonial context of plants, it, you know, in a, in, when the traditions exist in a family or in a community, it begins at birth. It begins in the womb when a child is being, hearing the parents talk about things or they're present in, in the time when they're doing something important and sacred or saying prayers. Um, you know, I have some of my earliest memories as being literally, I must have been a year and a half or two years old at by my grandmother's side as she would say the prayers to the four directions. 
and I remember her, how she would do it. So I think that as you start to reflect back, when you have an accumulation of that knowledge, if it's, well, if it's in your family, it really begins much earlier. But you almost have to have, be, be able to look backward to, to, to assess that over time, you know. Um, when you're in the middle of it, you really, you know, can't see what it is that you're learning. Uh -huh. So, you know, even the way uh, my grandmother would, would treat the plants, you know, when you have that, that, that kind of example of the great respect they have when they're, they're gathering a plant, um, you know, the love they had for their gardens and their, their roses and the flowers and um, how they would pray with holy water or pray over water or pray, you know, oh, well, we, well, you know, the way that they looked at cooking, you know, like, you know, with your hands, your state of life will affect your cooking. Your your food can be bitter. You know, if you're if you're you know, upset, your food can come out bitter and spoiled. You know, the meat will come out too tough, or the chile will be really hot, depending on your attitude. You know. Yeah, no, I know about that. So all of those things really are, are kind of are a teaching. You know, that builds over time. You know, about how if 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 you have a relationship to plants, it builds over time, and of course, it just keeps growing. Um, so, so with, with plants, um, you know, I guess one of the challenges now with herbalism as it be, it's become uh, taken from the family kitchen and cabinet and the herbs that people kept to take care of their family and it, again, it gets placed into, a, 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 you know, this kind of mass, mass production, this process of mass production and is that it, it loses, um, Unless that, that there's an herbalist producing their own um, line of products, right. which of course is a whole other issue now with all of the standardization laws that have yeah. you know in, in place, um, you don't know you know what's different about when a person a family maintains their relationship with their own plants is that they've gathered if they've gathered that plant or they know that somebody brought them a neighbor brought them this or a friend brought them that or you did a trade to get these plants from another region because. You know, I'm in Texas, and I, I uh, or, or I, we're in Arizona, and we have creosote, but up in New Mexico, they have uh, chuchupatle or bear root, and we've done a trade, and I knew that who the people are that gathered it, and I know they're good people, and they know I'm good people, and when I've gathered, I've said prayers, and they've said prayers, and then when we process it, we say prayers. Uh, you know, we're, we're praying uh, for them, you know, the whole process. Then that plan is going to be really more potent, because it's been infused with that that our heart, you know, our, what's in our minds, um, the way we live our lives, all those things, you know, our hands, the power in our hands. And, and, and that really is something that should not be lost, you know, despite this multi, multi-billion dollar industry, <laughs> when we think about the world, <laughs> right. oh, yeah. you know, the world context of this, uh, um, that it, it's really important for people to reclaim uh, the tea making and the tincture making and the mineral making, uh, the medicine making, for their own families, because it's as effective as many of the products that are out there. There's a very now very developed science in, al in these, these new supplements that are being created by um, the alternative healthcare industry. They're very sophisticated, but but what's lost then is that direct relationship people have with the plants. So I think from a native perspective, it's like they're alive, and that relationship we have with them is uh, part of the medicine. You know, you can have people who are strict herbalists in, in native communities. But most herbalists, it's not just the, the plants, it's the minerals. You know, I remember when I was training with one elder, he used to take me to go and gather minerals off of stones, right? And uh, so I, I just did a presentation yesterday, and I said, this is obsidian. And how is it that this obsidian, it will turn hot or cold based on the person's, what the person needs, the temperature, right? And I'm like, well, how does that obsidian know whether to get hot or cold? How does it know to the, what temperature the body's supposed to be at that will create equilibrium for that person? You know? How is it that a plant can tune into our body and respond to us? You know, it has intelligence. It's alive. So, so, so that um, I'd say that indigenous, traditional indigenous um, you know, herbalism for many, you know, for many peoples uh, isn't just the plant process. It's not just plants. It, it, it can you know, involve the stone, uh, the stone people, you know, the stones and uh, the minerals. Or, um, you know, um, a lot of our, our medicine ways, we can use fish, fish bone or 
uh, the needle of a maguey or a porcupine quill, and it's part of our treatments. And uh, we heated stones with herbs on them. Uh, we were doing stone massage way before the spas were, you know, and we never charged for that. Well, the, the payment wasn't in necessarily monetary in, in, in greenbacks, I guess, you know. You know. Uh, so this is from my, my land in Texas, and this you all know is mugwort, right? This was a, a, a plant that was banned in, by the, the, uh, the Spanish because it was a sacred medicine to us. In Mexico it was sacred, and this is also known as, um, it's also used by, it was used by a lot of uh, native peoples in Texas uh, and burned also ceremonially. So it's not just got a, um, a medicinal use, but plants have, when you talk about, you never, I think we, we don't just think of it in that physical realm. So what is ceremony, right? What is a ritual? If we understand that it, can, it has the ability to um, wash things off of us, it has the ability to uh, burn things off of us when it's smoked, uh, it has the ability to create equilibrium in our bodies if we ingest it. Um, you know, it, it, it comes in and out of those different things that we call ritual or ceremony, right? So this, uh, estafiate in Spanish, um, but has many other names, native Indian names, um, is, it's great for women's health, for menopause, um, for energy. It's, gr it's, the, uh, it's, it's a wonderful herb for uh, when you have chills, you have a cold with chills, right? And, um, it's an anti-parasitic. It um, w there was a man that had chronic pain, and I and I did a presentation, and this, and I made a very strong decon uh, decoction of this. But I had him just drink a little bit, and then we also will make liniments with this, and it was, it was like this chronic pain that he had for years just went away, and he wanted more. But you also have to watch because it is it can be toxic. It is, um, you know, it is a plant that has a lot of power to it. So you 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 kind of you have to watch. The doses is just just as the do that you would with the um, um, creosote. So this is a plant. So this came from Texas, but it's grown really well here. Although I've kind of, you know, it's kind of suffered with the freeze. It's a little frostbit here. Um, and then creosote. Well, creosote, or uh, was in, in, in the Mexican Spanish, it's called gobernadora, the governess, you know. It's got a lot of names. In Spanish, it's got uh, the Atom, different Atom names for this. It's also used by the Yaqui. For a while, they banned it because somebody had gotten uh, some liver toxicity from it. And this is the smell of the desert. When you have that smell of the desert after the rain, what you're smelling is this. Yeah. And uh, it's an amazing herb because it, it's a, an incredible antifungal. Um, you, in very small amounts, you take it for allergies or for uh, um, if you have um, a cold, right, post-nasal drip. So it's one of those herbs that, yes, it can be toxic if you don't know what to do with it. But, but people who have a relationship with this herb know that you just take a little bit of it, teeny amount. And a teeny amount is, uh, is therapeutic, right? Or it's just dipped into the water. It's not allowed to steep, or just a, just a, just enough of a thumbnail is taken and put into the water. And um, I tincture this. And when I teach my classes on Mexican traditional medicine, um, we t we tincture this because it's very abundant. And it um, yeah it can it can also um, be used in cancer to to fight cancer, and it helps to break down stones. So it has just, it's one of those herbs in the desert that, and this wood will never, you can save the stems and it can be uh, burned as um, um, an insect repellent. But it, it also, um, it's got a spiritual power, very protective. And I'm not going to talk about that other than to say that it has the power of protection. It does give off the power of protection. And so, you know, you think about if, if you put sticks of this um, around it kind of wards off insects. Mm -hmm. you warding, would evil spirits. War warding off insects, so its energy is to ward, is to throw out, you know. But I grew up along around some of the basic stuff like this and savila, ruda, oregano, estafiate, um, 
I, I didn't use Ruda, but my, my family used it, but I didn't really know that herb until an adult. And I think because it was a more powerful plant. And so that relationship really is the right of, a, of an adult to know that plant. And when you, especially when you're taking care of your children, these plants, uh, you know, I've said before, they're called plantas maestras, te teaching plants. And so master plants, ma master meaning having ma you know, the mastery of, of knowledge, mastery of power. And, um, and so it wasn't until adult that I learned some of these, um, these plants at a, at a more um, profound level because uh, you need to be responsible, you know, when you're working with these plants cause, because they can be toxic. My practice has never been separated from that ceremonial kind of uh, sacred knowledge so that the herbs are also supplementing the other ways that we, we help to e bring equilibrium to the body through balancing through these uh, more ceremonial um, healing, um, healing ceremonies, really. And, uh, but herbs uh, can be part of it, just like uh, the stones or the water may be part of it, or um, you know, some part of the an, an animal might be, uh, might be animal medicine that would be part of the healing, if, if that's what's needed. So um, not everybody did that, but, but certainly when you think about indigenous uh, plant knowledge, um, you, you can't think of it separate from the medicine of insects. You know, uh, the medicine of, um, you know, of the turtle or you know, I was out in Texas for a summer and I collected rattlers. You know, this, um, But this is all part of the medicine from the rattlesnake. And the turtle? It's medicine. It's medicine. I mean, it's, you know, I'm not going to talk about the specifics of it. Um, it's something that I inherited from my grandma. But. Um, Just, just as we, um, you know, uh, there's medicine from the bear, there's medicine from um, buffalo, there's, um, there's certain insects that have medicinal problems, P properties, many venomous things uh, have a medicinal property to them. Mm -hmm. So, so that, um, that could be part of the, the um, technology of a, a traditional herbalist. Not necessarily everybody, but it, it, you know, you don't necessarily think of it as an herbalist as only working with plant knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, they, they could also be working with other things from the natural world, you know. Uh, the water, uh, fire could be part of that. So, so it's integrated into the system of the four elements. And that's our medicine wheel, you know, throughout that in the four, we, the four directions. Or, or, or people have sacred directions, not necessarily just four directions, but sacred directions depending on their, their own uh, teachings about um, the sacred numbers. And so all of that's situated within that treatment. You know, all that knowledge and herbs are part of that. But there are very powerful plants that are, are used in birth uh, at, at, at very particular times. Uh, there's not necessarily, the, mid, the way I learned midwifery was n as little intervention as possible. So um, when I do use a plant for birth, um, it's, at a, it's at a real particular moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and not necessarily internally, it could be externally. Mm -hmm. And so that's that spiritual medicine uh, of a plant. That it's spiritual, just its its presence and how we uh, how we integrate it, not not through a tea, um, it could still have an impact on on, on two bodies, you know, a, a, a birthing mother, by the smell, by the burning of it, by you know it being placed into water and used it uh, used, it actually also can help to facilitate um, the birth process. Birth is a lot about, what do we call intuition? I mean, that could be sacred knowledge. It's like tuning into the body and listening and hearing the spirits and, and of the people and, and kind of feeling like what's happening with this baby as it's descending down the birth canal and the mom. But uh, also, um, the way I've been taught with, with birth is um, and that we're very careful about it, administering herbs while the baby's still descending down the birth canal because the baby can you know, if, 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 if herbs are ingested, it's also affecting the child. Mm -hmm. And so there's different philosophies around that with herbalism. You know, some midwives will give herbs um, more so than others. 
and so I, t I tend to take a more hands-off approach but I have other things in my hand in my as a in my birth bag right. <laughs> that I because of ceremony uh -huh. and 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 ceremonial medicine that that I will no, don't necessarily need to turn to a, an herb to try to have an intervention if, if I feel like I need it um, but also the elders that I work with are um, their philosophy is much much less use of herbs than, than another midwife might have another philosophy around that. You know. and I have a friend who's been, uh, you know, she's been learning for 35 years. She still doesn't call herself a, you know, any doctor or curandera. You know, that was the way we were taught. You know, we you don't just say you're something, even if you've had five years of it. You know, like you've been training for five years and you're still learning. You know, and. Uh, uh, that's um, it's hard because I think there's this real um, you know Mexican herbalism Mexican Indian herbalism um, there's this real push to say it, it, we want to name ourselves I mean in a society it's so important to have a you know an, a, a title and uh, um, yes, that's true. and and the traditional way was that you didn't you didn't you were named your community recognized you of course now we're not in those little neighborhoods and enclaves and barrios and you know, or in a native community where they may know you, but if you're in a native community, they, they know different things about different people, and they'll know who to go to. They know who the healers are. Yeah, or who has a special, a really good specialty in one area. Not everybody did everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you had, uh, when you look in, at the, the, the colonial documents uh, in Mexico, because they were trying to document all this to persecute the people, you mm -hmm. know, like, you know, they were doing demonic practices, right. you know, oh, in the yeah. eyes of the holy office. Um, I mean, you had like dozens of these specialized roles of healing, sucking doctors and the people who healed with stones and the people who strengthened the life force and the midwives and then the all around doctor and the bone setter and the, somebody who was kind of like, you know, doing more like what we can consider massage and, you know, uh, people who worked um, with uh, reading the calendars. And, and so you had um, many, many, many different uh, people who only work with children. Uh, to call their spirit back, to bring their spirit back into their body. So you had, um, you know, so you would go to different kinds of people. And you see that, like, even among different tribes where the, uh, the Navajo have people who do sings, uh, that somebody else might be a diagnostician and they're like a hand trembler, right? Or they're, um, you know, um, use a crystal to um, ascertain the, the source of the illness. And then a ceremony is then done, and, and there may be somebody else who does the ceremony. It may not be the same person who's the, the person who diagnoses it. So you have, and, and in some ways that provides a balance, you know, about you know you have you really know a particular way of doing something, and then and then the person needs that other step, uh, you know, may take that other step, and it, so it's a it's a, a a consort of people, right, a cohort of people that help to do the healing. That that is a specific instance, you know. Um, uh, you also have people uh, in, in tribes that, that do manage a lot of different things. So, so you know, it's not, it's not like a cookie cutter. There's so much diversity of, around medicinal knowledge mm -hmm. of the tribes, of the, 500, the more than 500 nations that are federally recognized. And then you have hundreds more who are not federally recognized who have their healing traditions. And then you have the Mexican Indian people and all the immigrants that are coming here from uh, the Americas, and they're bringing their, in, their native medicine with them. Mm -hmm and uh, Quechua people from Peru and um, uh, different Mayan peoples. Um, I've been working with elders for 20 years, these are elders um, for 20 years, and um, over 20 years I guess now, gosh, over 20 years, uh, since about 1990. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then before that, and with my family, my, my aunts, a couple of my aunts have passed away, uh, my grandma passed, my grandmas have passed away. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there's still elders that are there, and, and, and I've, in fact, I, I have a research grant that's looking at this very topic, and the elders would definitely say that if you're um, not learning with elders in your presence, you're not learning indigenous medicine, you're learning natural medicine, holistic medicine, but you're not learning traditional indigenous medicine. And then, and then as you start on your journey, that's the power of, of sacred knowledge, is that uh, it, uh, the spiritual world is so powerful that you may start to learn because you've lost your, your traditions in your family or your, uh, among your people, and you might learn from another traditional healer, but as you ask and you open up to the power of the universe, uh, knowledge can come back to you, mm -hmm. you know. So also some of, some of traditional healing, um, you know, it can be very set and formalized based on people's uh, native traditions. 
and then some of it is very much from a dream it's from you know you having a vision and, ha and having a great physical exertion um, you know uh, fasting and, and doing lots of ceremony and then something is given to you and you realize you know you're supposed to do that like um, this this plant I've dreamed a lot of it's it's a plant I'm supposed to work with and I work with it a lot because I've, I've dreamed it many many times so if it comes to you in a dream then you know that you're supposed to work with that plant the spirit the spirit of that plant's talking to you in a dream so um, I have great respect for this he's uh, a he's, um, he's like a uh, a, pl a plant of authority and he has a lot of knowledge mm -hmm. this is a this is a male plant as a male spirit there's an incredible story about an elder in mexico and she had a lot of mexican yam on her land and some scientists came and they over harvested and took all her mexican yam it was the mexican yam from where the natural progesterone is coming from yeah. and they just over harvested it and it it left it went away So, so there's a great debt that um, these, that the, not only the pharmaceutical companies, but uh, American Herbalism and all of these holistic companies, uh, and some are being a little bit more conscientious and, you know, providing some kind of, um, um, I guess, financial return to, to to indigenous peoples, but you know, most are not. And I think there should be, if nothing else, scholarship set up, and you know, uh, a pr maybe apprenticeship programs or um, you know, scholarships and education, or even um, mini grants, so that Native peoples could somehow benefit in a collective way. I think that would be a very uh, an ethical way to create equilibrium, because you know, uh, healing is all about balance. Mm -hmm. But we don't have a balance in the system, the monetary system. Mm -hmm. so. Or in the healthcare system. In the healthcare right. system, yeah, it's what draws people to 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 our knowledge, because precisely because it isn't, you know, workshop driven. It isn't. Um, Framed within the Western you know, kind of education experience, it's it's lived, it's and it's with very s a lot of love and a lot of sacrifice, mm -hmm. a lot of physical sacrifice. It's not earned through dollars. Mm -hmm. It's earned through these incredible relationships where people trust you with something. Hey, Yahoo! Yahoo! Yahoo!